Hello and welcome, class, to the end of chapter 17, where in chapter 17, uh, as a brief reminder, even though we've just been through it, uh, we've been focusing on acids and bases. So today we are going to be talking about finding the pH of other types of solutions. Uh, first, ones that contain a salt. Um, salt meaning, like in translation, some kind of ionic compound. As we will see, uh, some ionic compounds contain what appear to be uh, acidics or uh, acids or bases uh, within the ionic compound, um, and as such, will have an impact on our pH. Uh, second, we'll be talking about what happens when you start mixing your salts and your acids and bases together. Like what happens when you start putting uh, common ions in a solution with an acid or a base. All right, so uh, let's just get into it. Let's wrap up chapter 17. All right, so let's start by doing a little bit of conjugate acid base review. A Bronsted Lowry acid and base that differs from each other by a single H plus ion, which is what we have already introduced, is a conjugate acid base pair. So uh, in the following reaction, we have not just water being present, though water is present in solution since each of these species are labeled as being aqueous, right? Each of these uh, following molecules is dissolved in water in this kind of reversible reaction scenario. And we can label the conjugate acids and bases in the following reaction much the same way as what we did with the water or when the acid and base were only interacting with water. Here now we're kind of mixing acids and bases, but we can partner each of the reactants with one of the products. And the way that we're going to partner these is uh, here we see the HCOOH. Uh, this is formic acid. Is only one hydrogen different than different than this HCOO minus. This causes uh, the HCOOH on the left and the HCOO minus on the right uh, to be a conjugate acid base pair, where the weak acid. I'm just going to label as a WA, and the conjugate base, I'm going to label as a CB. Uh, we always, just for convention's sake, list the conjugate label on the product side, uh, and but this is only conventional standard, right? If we were to reverse this reaction and write the products as reactants and the reactants as products, we would still keep the conjugate label on the product side, just by conventional standards. The other molecules that are left in the reaction, we have this F minus, uh, this fluoride ion. If this were to gain a hydrogen, it becomes hydrofluoric acid, which is exactly what we see on the product side. So this F uh, minus, we're going to label as the weak base of the reaction, and the HF, we're going to label as the conjugate acid. So the weak acid and the weak base could hypothetically be pulling uh, or donating the hydrogen into solution, like into the solvent, or they could be donating it directly to each other, right? So this weak base could be pulling the uh, weak uh, or the hydrogen directly off of the weak acid, which is the nature of an acid and a base interacting together. We have the swapping of the H plus from one to the other, uh, which is exactly what leads to the products that we see as a result. So here we're getting a little bit into mixing acids and bases, but the important takeaway uh, is that we are learning to identify the conjugate acid base pairs here. Uh, which species in solution, reactant and product, pair together because one has either donated a hydrogen or accepted a hydrogen and then the product is the corresponding conjugate acid base as the result. Okay, so how then do the conjugate acid base pairs actually link together in solution? So, uh, and like, what are, what are the relative strengths? because due to the nature of water being our solvent, there is actually a connection between the strength of our weak acid and its corresponding uh, conjugate base, or the weak base and its corresponding conjugate acid, right? Because water dissociates reversibly in solution, giving us H plus and OH minus. One thing that we talked about as a result of water being our solvent is that our pH scale is kind of capped between one and 14. And this is just the nature of the water dissociating into the H plus and the OH minus and the balance that needs to be kept between the H plus and the OH minus. 
Similarly, if we have a weak acid and its corresponding conjugate base in water, the amount of H plus and OH minus that can be generated by these reactions must also adhere to the solvent being water's nature, its dissociation, and it, uh, it being the conjugate acid base pair has to play also within the brackets of this pH of 1 to 14. So because of this, what we actually found, or have found in conjugate acid base pairs is that a stronger acid is going to result in a weaker conj or conjugate base. If we were to increase the concentration of H+, let's say, in solution, we have found that the concentration of OH- has to decrease as a result of that. So if we have something that is a very strong acid that is going to be increasing the H plus concentration, in uh, the reversible reaction, the amount of base that is going to be creating OH minus is going to decrease. We're going to have less OH minus, and because of that, we're going to have a weaker conjugate base. Similarly, if we have a weaker acid, so we don't actually get a lot of H plus generating in solution, uh, because we don't have as much H+, plus, that is the result of a stronger conjugate base where we're actually getting a lot of OH, mi OH minus there being present in solution. So again, we are thinking of this in terms of our uh, seesaw. If we have H+, plus and OH minus just in neutral water, they are of equal amounts, equal concentrations, but as soon as we introduce a strong acid, the OH minus concentration is going to have to go down and vice versa. So in the diagram below, what we have labeled is acids uh, up on top, and the stronger acids are listed on the left, weaker acids uh, are listed on the right. So we have this relative scale going from strong acid on the left all the way down to weak acid on the right. Uh, the second bracket that is underneath the acids are the bases. Uh, specifically, the bases that are listed exactly correspond to the, weak, or the uh, acid up above. So we can see here we have HF. Uh, on the acid side, we can see it's listed kind of closer to the stronger acid side, so it's going to be generating plenty of H plus in solution. The uh, corresponding conjugate base, F minus, is listed directly down below. Now we can see that its Kb is pretty small compared to the uh, Ka of the HF, meaning that we're not going to be getting a lot of OH minus. Our higher Ka means that we will be getting plenty of H plus. Uh, and we can see that this is true across the entire diagram, that weaker bases are going to be on the left corresponding to stronger acids, and the uh, stronger bases on the right are going to be corresponding to weaker conjugate acids. Uh, let's see, and on the far ends of the spectrum, we can actually see that water is present. So the strongest of the strong acids is actually hydronium. Uh, if this hydronium were to lose one of its hydrogens, the corresponding weak base would be water. And we know that water is uh, perfectly neutral if it is the solvent, right? If only water is around, then we have this nice pH balance of 7. And we define pH using this H3O+, so it makes sense that this is, right, the strongest acid that we would consider. It's what sets the benchmark inside of solvent for what it means to be a strong acid. If we look to the far right-hand side of this diagram, where water is being considered as the weakest acid, its corresponding conjugate base is OH minus. And OH minus is what we use to set the bar for what it means to be a strong base. So water is both the uh, weakest acid and the weakest base. The conjugate acid and base of water are the strongest acid and the strongest base that you can possibly have in solution. Again, because these are what set the benchmark of a pH of 1 for hydronium and a pH of 14 for hydroxide in solution. Okay, so I just mentioned Ka's and Kb's being used as a measure for approximately how strong or weak your uh, weak acids and bases are. So is there a way to link together the Ka and Kb of, let's say, a weak acid and a corresponding conjugate base, right? Wa for weak acid, looking at its Ka, and the Kb of a corresponding conjugate base. So this isn't just any acid and base. This is specifically for a weak acid and its conjugate base pair. And the same uh, example could be applied to a weak base and its corresponding conjugate acid. We can use our Kw as a measure for relative conjugate acid conjugate base strength. So here we have this uh, equation that is set aside. Our Kw is equal to Ka times Kb. And again, this is for specifically a 
weak acid, weak base, conjugate acid base pair kind of situation. You can't use this just for any Ka or Kb. It has to uh, correspond to the weak acid and its uh, weak base counterpart. The reason why this equation is the way that it is, like how we derive it, is we start with what our uh, Ka is classically defined as. So if our Ka corresponds to some generic kind of weak acid dissociating in solution, the Ka that we can write is going to be equal to the product of the concentration uh, of our products, the H plus and the A minus, all divided by concentration of HA. And our Kb, we're also going to similarly define starting from the conjugate base of the weak acid that we had first added into solution in our kind of first generic hypothetical example. Our A minus interacting with water is going to give us some more of that conjugate acid back as well as OH minus. And so our Kb here is going to be equal to the concentration of our HA times the concentration of our OH minus all divided by A minus. All right, so if we were to take Ka and Kb and multiply them together, Ka times Kb, all right, so I'm just gonna bracket these off. So we're looking at these now being multiplied together, this X being our big multiplication symbol. We can see that the HA in the numerator on the right is gonna cancel with our HA in the denominator on the left. Our A minus that is in the numerator on the left is gonna cancel with our A minus that's in the denominator on the right. And what this is gonna leave us with is H plus times OH minus. So here's our concentration of H plus times concentration of OH minus, which is exactly equal to our definition of KW. So here we can see again, so long as we are using a conjugate acid base pairs, KA and KB, uh, the multiple of these two uh, equilibrium constants will be equal to the special equilibrium constant for water. So let's say we are looking back to that hypothetical first weak acid that we had in water, the HSO4 minus. It is known to have a Ka that is equal to 1.02 times 10 to the negative 7. We can use this information to find what the Kb, or Kb is of the weak base. So just to rewrite our generic dissociation that we had seen, our HSO4 minus was interacting with water reversibly to generate uh, some H3O plus and some SO42 minus. So we already know what the Ka is of this reaction in the forward types of direction, right? Our Ka is equal to 1.02 times 10 to the negative 7. So if we want to consider the reverse reaction, not necessarily like the pure reverse reaction, but now we're taking the conjugate base and the conjugate base is interacting with the solvent also, regenerating our HSO4 minus as well as some OH minus. Ka here is equal to 1.02 times 10 to the negative seven. We wanna know what our Kb is equal to. Well, all we have to do is take the equation that we have just learned. We just learned where it was derived from. Our Kw is equal to Ka times take our Kb to find what the Kb is equal to. Right, so our Kb is going to be equal to our equilibrium constant for water, our Kw, all divided by the Ka that we just learned. So if we take 10 to the negative 14, which is our Kw, right, that's an equilibrium constant that is always going to be constant, so long as we are working at the same temperature, which in parentheses, right, as an addendum here, all of the calculations we've been working through so far, we are assuming that we are at or near room temperature. We have not been varying temperature at all. So I want that to be explicitly clear. This Kw will change if we change the temperature of water, but we are not going to be doing that. All right, so we have our Kw. It is equal to 10 to the negative 14. We're going to divide by the Ka that we have just been told, the 1.02 times 10 to the negative 7. And this is going to give us an overall Kb, let's see, that is equal to 9.80 times 10 to the negative 8. All right, so if we want to compare the Ka to the Kb. What this tells us, whichever value is higher, uh, this is the overall, we could we would say, like uh, molecule or reaction that is dominant in aqueous solution. So because our Ka is higher, it is larger than our Kb, we would say that HSO4, or HSO4 minus, is a 
stronger weak acid than what SO42 minus is of a weak base. So this SO42 minus is a weaker weak base than what the W or what the HSO4 minus is of a weak acid counterpart. So the dominant reaction inside of this aqueous vessel is going to be the dissociation of the HSO4 minus, not by much, right? It's only of a, like a factor of 10 higher, a multiple of 10 higher, but that does mean that we are gonna have 10 times the acidity compared to the basicity inside of solution. All right, so now that we have talked about uh, how we can find Ka's or Kb's uh, of conjugates from their counterparts, like from the reactant side, the acids and bases, uh, let's look at how we can, uh, or where we can find conjugates in solution, um, even if we didn't place an acid or a base in solution in the first place. Namely, what happens if a salt, so like some kind of ionic compound, contains uh, a an ion that is going to behave either as an acid or base in solution. So what we're looking at is the pH change potentially uh, in aqueous conditions when we're adding an ionic compound. And previously, uh, back in like chapter nine, we talked about ionic compounds when being dissolved in solution as having a pH that is equal to seven. But what we are going to be talking about now, or at least addressing, is that this isn't always true. And here are the two main reasons why. First, some salts, so some ionic compounds, uh, contain weak or conjugate bases inside of them. The second point is that some salts contain weak or conjugate acids inside of them. So let's break these two examples down. We'll start with the conjugate base. So sodium fluoride is an ionic compound. We know that this is ionic since we have some type of cation, which is a charged metal, and we have an anion, which is a charged nonmetal. So it's gonna be increasingly important to go back to those old lessons, like what does it mean to be ionic? What does it mean to be molecular? Since uh, the realm of acid-base chemistry kind of uh, blurs these lines a little bit. But if we have some uh, metal and non-metal bound together, we have some ionic compound. And if this ionic compound is soluble, which our sodium compounds we've learned tend to be mostly always soluble, we are going to get some type of dissolution that occurs in uh, aqueous conditions. So the sodium fluoride, when introduced into water, is going to break into sodium plus aqueous and fluoride minus aqueous. Now this so far should not be too surprising, right? If we take some type of ionic compound that is soluble, right? This compound is soluble. We drop it into water. We're gonna get it uh, breaking up into two different ions. Now we're going to inspect these two ions in solution because this is where the potential pH change is going to be coming in. Uh, so we have sodium plus and fluoride with a minus charge. The question that we, are, we have to ask ourselves now when observing salts in solution is, are either of these ions weak or conjugate acids or bases unto themselves. In other words, is there a way for Na plus or F minus to interact with water either to generate some H plus or some OH minus when it interacts with the water? Now, sodium plus has no hydrogen on it, uh, meaning that there is no way for it to generate H plus in solution. Um, so no H plus. We also uh, know that sodium, if you were to like put this in water, sodium plus in water, it does not spontaneously generate OH minus in any way. In order for that to happen, this would have to write, if it's going to act as a base, pull H plus onto it, which is impossible. So sodium does not act as an acid or a base by our like conventional definitions of acids and bases, our Bronsted-Lowry definitions that we've been using. F minus, if we turn our attention here, also does not have an H plus on it, but we recognize this as some type of base, right? The F minus, if it were to interact with water, which it is liable to do since this is in aqueous conditions, there's tons of water around, this F minus is able to reversibly interact with the water, pulling a hydrogen away from it and generating some OH minus as a result. So because this F minus 
when interacting with water is able to generate some OH minus, we would expect the pH of sodium fluoride pH to be greater than seven. It is going to be basic or result in basic conditions when added into water. The second example we have, this ammonium chloride, we can set up solid. Uh, an example in the exact same way, this ammonium chloride as a solid when added into water is going to break up into its constituent ions. So we have the polyatomic ion of ammonium with an NH4 and a plus charge here. This will be aqueous and Cl minus aqueous. All right, so we're going to inspect both of these ions in exactly the same way that we just did the sodium fluoride. Uh, so first we have the ammonium ion, and the question here is, can this pull an H plus onto itself? Can it act as a base? Probably not, since it already has a plus charge, it's not gonna want to attract any additional hydrogens to it, so any H plus in solution is not going to be attracted to this NH4 plus. However, this NH4 plus does have a bunch of hydrogens and an extra plus charge, which means that if this were to interact with water, NH4 plus, aqueous, we can imagine a situation where water nearby is going to take one of these extra H pluses away from the ammonium. Uh, this will leave us with an ammonia, which we recognize also as a weak base, and H3O plus. All right, so here we have uh, an ion in solution, this NH4 plus, which is able to generate H plus or H3O plus in solution. Uh, so before we come to a final decision on its pH, let's also observe the second ion that's present here, so the Cl minus. Obviously there's no hydrogen here, so there's no way that this can act as an acid in solution, but is there a way for this to act as a base, just like how the F minus did? Well, let's draw out what that would look like. If this Cl minus were to act as a base and pull an H plus onto itself, this would result in HCl. HCl we know is a strong acid, which means that a uh, like any type of HCl that would regenerate in solution would immediately break back down into H plus and Cl minus, right? Strong acids are strong because they dissociate irreversibly. There is no way for this Cl minus to be strong enough of a base to pull H plus onto it because its conjugate acid, Cl minus's conjugate acid, is a strong acid, which means this reverse reaction breaking into ions is going to dominate. Overall, what this means for our NH4Cl when it is added into uh, aqueous conditions is we have some type of weak acid here, this NH4 plus, which is able to generate some H3O plus, and we have this Cl minus, which is too weak of a base to counter the acidic behavior of the NH4 plus. Overall, we can draw the conclusion that the pH of NH4Cl when added into solution is going to be acidic or less than seven. Okay, so what this means overall, why we're paying attention to the pH of salt solutions is that when we add some salts into solution, we are going to get some type of pH change, which is either going to alter just the pH of neutral water or would potentially interact with an acid or a base that is already in solution. All right, so let's explicitly calculate uh, the pH of a salt solution before moving on, um, you know, and looking at what it looks like in solution when we have some acid or base already present and how these things are going to interact together, right? Let's not get ahead of ourselves. So the pH of a salt solution, uh, we can calculate in the exact same way that we have been calculating pHs and POHs, or pOHs uh, of weak acids and weak bases. So we have uh, sodium fluoride here. We're told what the volume of our water is. We are dissolving 0.5 moles of the sodium fluoride, and here we have a Kb present for our weak base that we've already identified. Our goal is to find the equilibrium pH. So we've already estimated that this is a pH uh, that should be greater than seven. So let's find what the exact pH is going to be. All right, our first step is we have to figure out what is the initial concentration of our F minus in solution, since the F minus itself is what is the base. The sodium fluoride, not basic. 
Once this dissociates into sodium plus and fluoride minus, that fluoride minus is what is the base. So our first job is to figure out stoichiometrically, mm, here's an old word we haven't heard in a while, stoichiometrically, how much of our F minus do we have? All right, so here's going to be the crux of chapter 17, and here's actually why the book separates chapters 16 and 17. Because yes, what we're talking about is acid-base chemistry, but we are going to be bringing back uh, stoichiometry, tying that back into the calculations that we're gonna be doing. The question that you need to be asking yourselves is, is the reaction complete? If the answer is yes. If your reaction is a complete reaction, like our sodium fluoride dissociating into sodium and fluoride in aqueous conditions, what this means is that we are going to be using stoichiometry to perform our calculations. If your reaction is reversible, then we will be using the ice table approach. So we have to be or make sure that we are keeping our math, our algebra consistent and straight with whatever type of equation or chemical reaction we are observing. All right, so let's turn back our attention to the sodium fluoride. Well, we know that we started with 0.5 moles of the sodium fluoride, and since this dissociation reaction happens in a one-to-one, -one, there's going to be one mole of fluoride that is generated per every one mole of NaF that gets used up. Writing this out, may suddenly seem very trivial or mundane or unnecessary, but I promise getting back into the habit of explicitly showing your stoichiometry is going to be very useful as we start working into the more and more complex problems. So we're going to break down our problem into two pieces. Our first piece here is the complete dissociation, which is going to generate 0.5 mole of F minus that is going to be present in solution once all of the sodium fluoride has completely dissociated into our F minus. Okay, now that we have our moles of fluoride present here, uh, our next job is to use this value in uh, the calculation for figuring out what the pH of our solution is going to be. All right, so in order to clean this up a little bit, I am going to erase the writing on the screen. So if you have not yet written down everything, please do so. All right, now that this is erased, right, we have figured out how many moles of our F minus we have in solution, our 0.5 moles of F minus. And from here, we are going to now set up our reversible uh, acid base reaction with water. Uh, in much the same way that we just wrote the equation on the previous slide when we were demonstrating that F- is able to act as a weak base in solution, uh, our F-, minus, now that it is broken away from all of our sodium pluses, can interact with water reversibly to create um, some HF, no charge, aqueous conditions, and some uh, OH- minus aqueous. All right, so the way that we're going to now use this setup is the exact same way that we've used any time or any case of a weak acid base equilibria looking for pH kind of problem. So we have our F minus, we know an initial condition, we have 0.5 moles per every one liter. Again, it is going to be incredibly important to uh, convert all of our values in the ice table into the units of molarity, since all of our equilibrium constants, our Ka's, our Kb's, are all types of Kc's, which means we need everything to be in concentration units. All right, that's just a general reminder. Uh, we're gonna be looking for some type of change and then finding an equilibrium value. Water, again, don't have to worry about since it is a liquid. Nothing new is happening there. Uh, we're not changing the rules all of a sudden. This is a heterogeneous equilibrium uh, problem, which means the water we are not going to count. Now, initially, right, since we're only taking sodium fluoride and dissolving it in solution, there should not be any HF present. And similarly, there is no OH that has already been generated from the sodium fluoride. This is exactly what we are here to calculate. What is the change that is occurring as the F minus is interacting with water and creating these new products once equilibrium has been reached? All right, so 0 0.5 minus X with an X here and an X here. 
Uh, okay, so our problem already is almost complete. The reason being is I am going to take a shortcut in solving for this problem since our KB is equal to an incredibly small number, right? 1.40 times 10 to the negative 11 is very, very small, definitely smaller uh, than our initial conditions by a significant margin. So what this means is I'm going to take the shortcut where I can drop this minus X here since the change from our initial condition is going to be so insignificant. So our KB is going to be equal to X squared since we have our two products multiplied together, all divided by 0 0.5. Now when rearranging and solving for X, our X is going to be equal to 2.65 times 10 to the negative six molar. All right, this X is not what we were charged to find though. Our X we can see is equal to our equilibrium concentration of OH minus. Our OH minus concentration is not what we were explicitly looking for, right? We're looking for equilibrium pH. What this means is we are gonna have to use our KW is equal to concentration H plus times concentration OH minus, since we are working in aqueous conditions, to be able to solve for what our H plus concentration is. In rearranging this equation, our H plus concentration is equal to KW, all divided or divided by concentration OH minus, which is what our X value is equal to. Our KW is equal to 10 to the negative 14. This is all from chapter 16. Our KW value is not changing. Take this divided by 2.65 times 10 to the negative 6 molar. Uh, and what this means is that you are going to end up with a concentration of H plus that is equal to 3.78 times 10 to the negative 9 molar. Last but not least, we uh, can use this to solve for what our pH is equal to, since pH is equal to negative log of this concentration that we just found, our pH is equal to 8.42. All right, so I flew through that math. Absolutely, go back, take your time, see if you can't uh, hit these big check marks, uh, you know, as you're going through the calculations. Um, the important part, the important takeaway, is that we predicted that the pH of this sodium fluoride in solution would be greater than seven, and here we can see that we do in fact have a solution that is uh, of basic conditions. Our pH is greater than seven. And this is all because our F minus was able to act as a weak base interacting with water and generating some OH minus in solution. Well, now that we have taken the time to look at the relationship between conjugates in solution, as well as the magnitude of their respective Ka's and Kb's, um, as well as uh, observing what happens when you add salts into solution that can change uh, or impact the pH, what we're going to turn our attention to is what happens when you mix a weak acid and its conjugate base, or even a weak base and its conjugate acid. The result of such a combination is going to result in what we call pH buffer solutions. This by definition is a solution that contains a certain amount of weak acid or base uh, so it could be, you know, HF, like what we just studied, but also it has its conjugate present. So a weak acid in solution will be with its conjugate base, or a weak base will be in solution with its conjugate acid. The result, though, of both of these species being present is that you're going to uh, be working with a solution that is going to be more resistant to pH change due to the common ion effect. If F minus is present, According to our equilibrium expression, as we have our, F, our HF interacting, dissociating, creating some F+, plus, if we have an increased amount of our F+, plus, what this means is that we are going to uh, be resistant to changing or neutralizing any of this HF. Right, if we neutralize a certain amount of this HF to create some F-, minus, because we already have F- minus present, according to our dissociation reaction, we're going to be regenerating some of this HF that was previously neutralized by the strong base. All right, so we can use this as a qualitative description as to why the pH did not change as much in our second solution. 
uh, in the chart or illustration below, we can kind of see a diagram represent or representation of what it was that I just said. If we have some type of buffered solution, uh, so here we have acetic acid present in solution with the acetate ion. If we were to hypothetically add some H3O+, yeah, we're going to be neutralizing a little bit of the CH3COO-, that acetate ion, and we will be generating some of this acetic acid, but we can see that there relatively wasn't that much of a change from the conditions that we started with, since both of them were present uh, in a like pretty significant or marginal amount. If we were to add some of our weak base, we would see, again, there's a little bit of a difference here. We're shifting away from that uh, you know, equal concentration, but it's not so significant of a difference that we're going to see a significant difference in the overall H plus concentration. Because really, again, that's what connects to pH. pH is a representation of the H plus concentration. And so if we're uh, going to be neutralizing the weak acid or weak base that's present by adding some strong acid or strong base, if we don't see a huge shift away from our initial conditions, we're not going to see a huge shift in the corresponding pH. Buffered solutions are incredibly important. Buffered solutions are what keep you and me alive. If you've ever wondered, again, why is it that like your stomach acid doesn't just like eat through your entire body? Why is it that you are not just like a puddle of jello since we, uh, we have pH differences all across our body? It is because of buffers. The solutions inside of our body contain weak acids and bases as well as the conjugate ions readily present. And these conjugate ions are what keep our pH levels stable. It's what prevents us from neutralizing ourselves as we exist. Okay, so how do we know that a buffer is a buffer? Since we, you know, like, let's say for instance, in the first example, we had some HF, there was no conjugate base present, but through the neutralization reaction, we created some uh, of our sodium fluoride. How, like, was that a buffer? How do we know? The buffer capacity or the capacity with which a solution can be considered to be a buffer uh, is according to the definition below. If your conjugate base uh, to weak acid proportion is somewhere between a magnitude of 10 and 1 tenth, you're working with a buffer. You are working with a solution that is going to be resistant to pH change. So our buffer capacity definition is uh, the greater the concentrations of your weak acid and conjugate base, the more of both of these you have, the more resistant to pH change your solution will be, the more buffered your solution will be, because it's going to take more and more of your strong acid or strong base to neutralize your weak acid or conjugate base. If you have a ton of this present, there's not going to be a whole ton of neutralization going around. Your solution is going to be buffered at a specific pH and your system will be stable. All right, so since buffered solutions are so resilient because they are so resistant to pH change, uh, two scientists by the name of Henderson and Hasselbach decided to see if there was a way to more easily calculate, well, what are the pHs of these solutions since they uh, are so like resilient to change? The Henderson-Hasselbach equation is what they came up with. This is used to calculate the pH of a buffered solution in which the equilibrium concentrations of your acid and your conjugate base are known. And because this is a buffered solution, your equilibrium conditions will be similar to initial conditions. There's not going to be a lot of a change here. This is exactly why we can use the Henderson-Hasselbach shortcut. If your solution, if your solution is not a buffer, no Henderson-Hasselbach equation for you. Your solution must be a buffer. If it is not a buffer, you will not get the correct pH. If your solution is not a buffer, you will have to go through all of the ice calculations as we have been learning. If your solution is a buffer though, we can use the equation that is outlined here, where your pH is going to be uh, able, or able to be calculated by taking the pKa, which is equal to the negative log of your Ka, 
and you can add v log of the concentration of your conjugate base divided by the concentration of your weak acid. All right, again, working with buffers or acknowledging buffers is incredibly important for anyone who, uh, you know, uses or looks, looks at chemistry as a way to appreciate life as it has developed on Earth. Um, working with, though, buffered solutions is also very handy when working with any type of biochemical setup. I know a fair number of you in class are interested in the biochemistry major, or at the very least are interested in biochemistry as a topic. Uh, one really neat study or molecule to study biochemically is hemoglobin, right? It is very widely studied. That is what the illustration is here. Uh, we have this huge protein structure and the protein itself uh, is only stable or only does its job is what I should say at a pH of 7.4. Your blood is ever so slightly basic, but if your, uh, if the pH in your blood becomes acidic, your uh, hemoglobin no longer wants to bond to O2. If your conditions in your blood, your pH drops to less than seven, hemoglobin really likes bonding to carbon dioxide, which is a problem because carbon dioxide, if it gets stuck in your blood, is going to cause you to asphyxiate. So if you want to study hemoglobin uh, in a way to understand what's going on in the human body, you need to make sure that your solution has a pH that is 7.4. If your pH is too low, you're going to get incorrect binding. If your pH is too high, the protein itself breaks. And so you're not gonna get a really good uh, you know, result or study or whatever if you're working with hemoglobin if your pH is off. So let's learn how do you intentionally prepare a buffer solution for the cases where you are going to be working with biochemical molecules or whatever your study might be. And buffers can be made one of two ways. Either one, our buffers can be made by mixing a weak acid and its conjugate, or number two, by neutralizing a weak acid and generating its conjugate. So either way, we will have a mixture of our weak acid and its conjugate present inside of solution. So what this is going to look like in situation one, we'll focus on situation one right here, is that we would have a solution, like we can see, here's my beaker filled with the solution. And let's say the solution right now is just straight up our weak acid. Uh, and I'll just represent this with our generic weak acid uh, formula, HA, um, where H is the acidic uh, you know, hydrogen in the structure and the A here stands for our anion, uh, whatever it's gonna be. Now, the solution currently, yes, is dissociating. There's going to be a little bit of interaction with H2O, reversibly generating some A- and H3O+. Um, however, if we're looking at a weak acid, we can assume this dissociation is relatively weak, and most of the solution is going to be just weak acid. If we want to make our solution a buffer, if we want to make this solution P- H change resistant, right, pH change resistant, what we're going to do is add a salt to this, and the salt is going to contain some kind of uh, like positive ion, let's say sodium is a very common one, or even potassium, and the counter ion in this is going to be A. A being also the conjugate of our weak acid. So when this Na, this sodium A, you know, this hypothetical conjugate, um, get added into solution, this is also going to break up. Um, Na is going to dissociate into Na plus and A minus. Now the Na plus doesn't have any type of pH impact. This we literally just learned. However, as this NaA, this sodium A, breaks up, what we are going to be paying attention to what we add is the A minus. So in essence, to this beaker, I am just adding a bunch of A minus floating around. And it is the balance now, the existence of our weak acid and this A minus uh, present in solution at the same time that's going to create a buffer solution that is going to make this thing now uh, resistant to pH change. 
Uh, the second method for creating a buffer, the neutralization of a weak acid and uh, the generation of its conjugate as a result, we're actually going to save until next lecture. So we're going to wait until uh, we start getting into titrations and neutralization reactions to return to method two. But for right now, we will look at method one and we are going to, in the very next slide, uh, look at the this type of problem. So how can we not only just hypothetically generate a buffer solution, like how can we prepare a buffer solution, but how can we intelligently prepare a buffer solution so that it is going to be resistant at a particular pH, um, just like, uh, let's say if we go backwards to uh, the importance of our buffers here, hemoglobin is a great example of something, a, pro or a protein that exists at a very, uh, or exists and functions at a very specific pH. So if we want to study something like this hemoglobin, how can we create a solution that is going to stick at a pH of 7.4 and be resistant to pH change? So here we have uh, an example laid out to create a phosphate buffer. Phosphate buffers are uh, like really common buffers in biochemical labs. Um, phosphate in this problem specifically, we're going to be using to create a buffered solution that has a pH that is equal to 7.4. So our question is what mass of K2HPO4 are we going to have to add to a solution that is 100 milliliters total uh, that currently is a 0.1 molar solution of H2PO4 minus, uh, the Ka of this molecule is present here, in order to create that buffer. Like how much of the uh, hydrogen phosphate do we have to add to the dihydrogen phosphate to actually create a useful buffer? Well, the key word in this problem is buffer. Anytime you see the word buffer, you gotta be thinking to yourself, Henderson Hasselbach because this is going to be saving you a world of hurt in the calculation uh, category. When I say that, I mean we can use the Henderson-Hasselbach equation, our pH equal to pKa plus log concentration A minus divided by concentration HA uh, in order to figure out the solution to this problem, or at least as a first step in the solution to this problem. Because our question is how much of the question mark, how much of the conjugate base, the A minus, do we have to add to the acidic solution in order to create a P or a buffered solution with a very specific pH? So in other words, in the Henderson-Hasselbach equation, we are looking for the concentration of A minus. Since we know the volume of our solution and we know the formula of the compound, we can figure out what is the exact mass that we're gonna to have to add? But first we need to figure out what's the concentration at equilibrium that we need to actually make the buffer. All right, so we have a pH that is given to us, 7.4. We have the Ka of the uh, weak acid that we're gonna be considering. So this is a negative log of 6.2 times 10 to the negative eight. We're gonna be adding the log of our unknown, which is our A minus, all divided by the concentration of our weak acid, which is in this case a 0.10 molar. Now, how did I know that the H2PO4 minus is the weak acid in this case and not the conjugate base, right? Because there's a minus sign here. Well, there were two hints. The first hint is that we are given a Ka that is directly after the molecule. Ka A means acid. Uh, pretty, you know, easy to tell there that the H2PO4 minus the molecule that preceded it is going to be an acid. The second uh, hint or the second clue is that the H2PO4 had one more hydrogen than the HPO4, right? If we get rid of this K2, this whole thing is going to have a two minus charge, meaning that it has lost one of its hydrogens. So that's what tells us that this molecule right here is the a minus or the conjugate base of the weak acid that we are going to be studying. So from here, it's going to be a matter of algebraically rearranging and solving for what our A minus is. Uh, so let's do that math. We have a 7.4 is equal to the negative log of our Ka. Uh, what this value comes out to be equal to is 7.21. This is going to be added again to the log of our A minus all divided by 0.10 molar. We can subtract the 
or 7.21 from each side, minus 7.21. Uh, what this gives us, whoop, go up here, is a uh, value of 0 0.192 equal to the log of the concentration of A minus, all divided by the concentration uh, of our HA, which is 0 0.10 molar. Now, if we want to get rid of this log, we're going to have to raise both sides into the exponent of 10. So 10 to the 0 0.192 uh, gives us a value of 1.56. This is going to be equal to the concentration of A minus all divided by 0 0.10 molar. If we multiply this 0 0.10 molar up, what this uh, gives us is a concentration of A that is going to be equal to 0 0.156 molar if we want to create a buffer with a pH that is equal to 7.4 if we are working also again with the uh, phosphate system. So from here, right, because we've set up and we've found our concentration of A minus, this is not exactly what was asked of us, right? We're asked to find a mass. Well, how fortunate for us then that the second half of this problem is very similar to a problem that we've seen either in lab before or chapter eight, chapter nine. We have a concentration, which is in units of mole per liter. We also have a liter and we can find a molar mass of the K2HPO4 to convert our molar value into grams. So our concentration of A minus, just to rewrite that, is equal to 0 0.5156 molar, which is equal to 0 0.156 moles per liter. We want to get or use this information to figure out what this value is going to be in grams. Well, if we start with a certain volume amount, which we know how, uh, how much solution we have, we know what that volume is, 100 milliliters is equal to 0 0.100 liters. And we can take that value and multiply it by our concentration, the 0 0.156 moles per every one liter, cancel out our liters via dimensional analysis to find 0 0.156 moles, or 0 .0, 0 0.0156 moles. We can take this and multiply it by the molar mass of our K2HPO4. The molar mass of this value, right, by observing the periodic table, adding all of the pieces that we need together, two potassiums, one hydrogen, one phosphate, or phosphorus, and uh, four oxygens, gives us a value of 174.2 grams per mole. Now we can take our molar value, multiply it by 174.2 grams per every one mole, the moles cancel out according to dimensional analysis. And this gives us a final value of 2.712 grams of K2HPO4 that must be sprinkled into our 100 milliliter solution of 0.1 molar H2PO4 minus, and we will have a buffer that is at a pH of 7.4, a solution at that particular pH that is going to be resilient or resistant to change and could be used for any type of either biochemical study, analytical study, uh, inorganic study, whatever the P or whatever the study is that you are working with. If you wanted it a pH of 7.4, here's how you make it. All right, and that is going to be chapter 17. So here we have some section review problems. Uh, first and foremost, the conjugate acid-base pairs uh, problems look at using our equilibrium constant to find either the Ka or Kb. Um, of a conjugate acid base pair. Uh, so for instance, if we know the Ka of our weak acid, we can find the Kb of our conjugate base using this equation. Uh, second, we talked again about the pH properties of salt solutions as uh, something that is a salt like NaF breaks down in solution. Some of the ions like Na plus will not have any impact on the pH. But other ions, like our F minus, we can see is a conjugate base. It is going to have basic behavior in solution. Therefore, NaF, when dissolved, will uh, cause a pH change. And lastly, we talked about uh, what it means to have a buffer solution and how we can prepare buffer solutions. Um, notice that the section review problems here are from chapter 18. That is not a typo. Uh, chapter 18 
um, focuses, uh, like, as we've seen a little bit already on KSP or solubility, but it also focuses on neutralization. Uh, specifically the neutralization of acids and bases. So uh, when we come back, we are going to be jumping into chapter 18. That's going to be our last unit or our last chapter uh, for this semester. And um, we're definitely still going to be building up off of our acids base conversation, but we're going to be looking at the role of neutralization uh, in studying our weak acids and weak bases. All right, but for the time being, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask those questions. And until next time, class is dismissed.